This video is about the Laplace transform and its poles, zeros, and region of convergence. I will not be going into detailed math, but will rather talk about concepts. I will motivate the conversation by looking at systems described by constant coefficient differential equations in the time domain, which applies to a very broad class of problems. The Laplace transform, denoted by L of H of T, is equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of h of t times e to the minus st dt where s is a complex value that's equal to a real part sigma plus an imaginary part omega denoted as sigma plus j omega and the result of this computation will be denoted as a capital H of s. A very useful property of the Laplace transform is that differentiation in time corresponds to multiplication by s in the Laplace domain. In other words, taking the nth derivative in time and going through the Laplace transform corresponds to multiplication by s to the nth power. So for example, the third derivative of y of t dt corresponds to s cubed times y of s. This is very useful when solving differential equations. A linear constant coefficient differential equation can be written in the following form. Using the Laplace transform, we can rewrite this in the following way. And then we can define our transfer function, h of s, as y of s divided by x of s. And then we can write it in this form, which can further be factored into this last form. In this form, each zi is a zero of this fraction, and each pi is what's called a pole. At each zero, the transfer function goes to zero, since the numerator becomes zero. At each pole, the transfer function goes to infinity, since the denominator becomes zero. These poles and zeros then completely define the transfer function that we're interested in. We can plot these poles and zeros in the complex S plane, where the horizontal axis is the real component of S, and the vertical is the imaginary component of S. And as we had defined it previously, S is equal to sigma plus j omega, so the real axis is sigma, and the imaginary axis is omega. We can plot the poles and zeros in this plane by using O's to represent zeros and X's to represent poles. So for example, suppose that we have a real zero over here. Real, it has no imaginary component. And also suppose we have a complex conjugate zero. Poles and zeros will always either be real or complex conjugates for these kinds of systems because our differential equation had real constant coefficients. The poles can furthermore be also put on here as x's and again in complex conjugate pairs. And this image here fully defines our s-plane and the whole transfer function because once again we can always write it in this kind of a form. There is another property of the Laplace transform, namely the region of convergence. The region of convergence defines where, in the s-plane, the function actually converges. We can look at this from a mathematical perspective first, by looking once again at the Laplace transform, and recognizing that s again is sigma plus j omega, it's a complex 
value, so it has a real and an imaginary component, and so this is equal to, and just by grouping terms, we get, which is nothing more than the Fourier transform of h of t times e to the minus sigma t, and this exists if this term, h of t times e to the minus sigma t, is stable. Therefore, we can think of it as pre-multiplying our signal or system by e to the minus sigma t and taking a Fourier transform. Well, this only exists if this whole signal here is stable, and therefore the region of convergence is defined by sigma in the s-plane because for an appropriate sigma, this signal is going to converge. Furthermore, we know that in the s-plane, we're going to delineate our stable region, our region of convergence, using the poles, since we know that at the poles, this whole transfer function explodes. It goes to infinity. Therefore, poles cannot be in the region of convergence since the function does not converge for them. So a possible region of convergence here would be at this pole location, and it would be everything to the right of this. That is a possible region of convergence. Now, I don't want to spend time talking about the various intricacies of the region of convergence, but instead I want to illustrate what I've been saying with an example. For this example, consider the following system. Using the Laplace transform, we can rewrite it in the following way which gives us the transfer function, which is once again y of s divided by x of s, which is equal to this. And then rewriting it in forms of poles and zeros, we get this. Now we can plot this in the s-plane. We have a zero at s equals negative two, so a real zero, and we have two poles at complex conjugate locations at negative 1 plus 2j and at negative 1 minus 2j. So something like this. And this again fully characterizes the Laplace transform of this transfer function. However, it should be noted that it can be evaluated at any location s, not just at those poles and zeros. The entire s-plane is full of values of the corresponding function h, it's just that the poles and zeros give us the full picture as was defined by the factorization of the polynomials that define the transfer function h. In this illustration created in MATLAB, we can see the same thing that we just saw. We have these two poles and a zero, and this line corresponds to the region of convergence it goes along the poles. And the region of convergence will either be to the right of this or to the left of this. However, even though we can define everything in terms of the poles and zeros, every value here is actually going to be defined for the transfer function h as long as it is in the region of convergence. Here is another view of the same thing, except now I've evaluated the function, the magnitude of h of s, at each value of s inside the region of convergence, which I assume to be to the right of our poles. And this is what we see, and we can actually look at this in three dimensions and we get a better picture. You can see the function blowing up at the poles as we expect because it goes to infinity, but it's also defined everywhere smoothly throughout. It's just that everything is fully characterized by the poles and zeros, so we don't need to show this kind of a complicated graph every time we want to study the function h of s. Overall, we have seen how the Laplace transform is characterized by a ratio of polynomials in s and is therefore fully defined by its poles and zeros. We have seen what the poles and zeros mean and we have shown the entire s-plane for a particular example.